Uh, I'm Dave. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for finally finding a way for me to come to Finland. It's beautiful outside. Love it. <laughs> um, so this talk is, is very much on understanding some, a general model that immunity uses uh, in order to spend money. And uh, particularly if you do not have DARPA-sized budgets, uh, understanding what I call, someone asked me, they were trying to be cheeky, and they were like, you don't even know the difference between strategy and tactics. And I'm like, well, strategy is what I can get DARPA to pay for, and tactics is what I have to pay for, right? So, uh, so in many cases, this is the talk. Everyone's like, we need more structure on your talk. This is the talk. We're going to talk about some policy stuff. It doesn't last too long. Please do not fall asleep. Uh, actually, the coffee here in Finland is really good. Uh, we, we have a little bit of the technical characteristics and the model that immunity uses when we have to project our own spending. And then we make some predictions, hopefully better than a crystal ball, but probably not a lot better, I'll be honest. And we talk about some things that would, in theory, apply to Finland um, and other people in the Finnish uh, size sphere. So uh, you already got a little briefing on my personal interests in Buffy the Vampire Slayer and how they're relevant to you, which is not at all. But I think um, it is kind of funny because sometimes you can be in the industry for a long time and there's still, because our industry is so big, a ream of people who have no idea what you've done in the past. Uh, I used to work a lot with fuzzing and vulnerability and exploitation implant development because you used to have to do everything. Right? Nowadays, you do not have to do everything. Uh, these days, I uh, annoy Kaspersky. So, uh, respected but occasionally writes troll posts. Uh, that's, that's my new job title, trolley. So, I'm not weave though, don't, don't get the wrong idea. Uh, I want to talk a little bit recently, not so recently, but a, a year or so ago, I started playing Overwatch. Does anyone in here play Overwatch? Let's just get a show of hands. All right, so like three people. Perfect, because this talk has a lot of Overwatch in it, and you'll think I'm good. Um, but what I realized is I'm really bad at computer games, and I used to think I was quite good. Uh, but all computer games are kind of now the same thing. Right? So you end up with different roles on your team. doesn't matter. World of Warcraft, League of Legends, they're all the same game underneath it. And each character has their own uh, capability set, and those capability sets change over time, and how you fit together as a team depends on how you win. Also, how great your reactions are, which, as it turns out, in my case, does not apply. Uh, so some of that also, that general sort of ability to understand where the strategy should be, applies a lot to how we do cyber war. And I know that everyone's furiously trying to read this slide. Uh, but the reality is, is that if you look at, if you're DARPA, you can fund every possible strategy, right? You can have a TAO level operator mega team, which I always thought was a terrible idea. You can have, you know, fully automated suites of exploitation tools, which have some advantages and some disadvantages. You can use remote worms. We've seen those used recently, especially. Uh, and of course, you can also go the Russian model or the Chinese model, where you just have many small teams of people doing an independent tool chain and making things work. So each of these strategies, some of which you are investing in just one at a time, and some of which you can invest in all, all at once if you have the budget, right? But, but they all depend on various characteristics. Essentially, the map and the terrain of cyber war changes very rapidly over time, and we completely ignore it, right? Like, we completely pretend that, you know, a big TAO-like team is going to work forever. This is, it's going to have a particular set of advantages forever. But those advantages actually increase and decrease very rapidly and require analysis, and this talk is a lot about how we conduct that analysis. And one of the questions that I really wanted to answer was, why is T2 here, right? Why are there small conferences? Why is this still the kind of place where you see leading research and development? It's a, and it's a sort of a fascinating question because in this kind of environment, there should be no small players. There should be one big player owning everything. Uh, and it's not true. And one of the things that informs this strategy is anyone dipping their toe into the sewage pit that is the cyber policy world, right? So some of you, I hope, have, have made better choices in life than I have. But one of the choices I've made is looking a little bit at what the United States policy arm is doing in cyberspace. And I put the fail boat thing on there because the State Department recently realized they were the fail boat, which is new. Uh, 
And they've sort of, sort of come to this idea that we're, we're not winning in cyber policy if by any definition of the terms. Pretty much if the Russians have hacked your election and you'd only found out afterwards, you're not winning, right? Like, that's not a thing you're doing. And, and, and I tried to explain to them the reason and they got really upset. But the, the reality is, is they're getting a lot of their direction from two arms of of that they've built up these big academic cyber policy engines and their international law legal community, which is a uh, pretty epic fail on both parts. And it results in things like the Wassenaar arrangement, right? So the Wassenaar arrangement, for those of you who have not uh, tortured yourselves with it, is the export control arrangement that most first world countries and Russia have signed up to, to control arms, basically stealth technology, missile technology, and other things. Israel's also not a signatory, but certainly is involved. They sort of mirror it all, in case you were curious. Um, the, the reality is, is that none of this stuff works when you talk about cyber. So although they want to stretch these arms control arrangements to fit cyber into them, they refuse to admit when they fail. And so things like even regulating CPUs now is a ridiculous thing because we don't regulate them on floating point operations. Uh, you can't actually describe anything that we do in cyber in any sort of functional way, not because it doesn't work. Some of it doesn't work, clearly. Um, but, you know, the very concept of dual use and a Turing machine don't really fit together. And this was sort of, these are things I ended up getting on the United States board that does all this work which has not yet implemented the Wassenaar arrangement for cyber, um, which was a very fun, engaging exercise of pain. So there's, you know, just like you have vulnerability classes in all the technical stuff that we're about to listen to all day, you have vulnerability classes when it comes to the policy world. And one of those things, and I keep pressing the volume button, sorry about that. One of those things is assuming code has an intent that if I am the creator of the code, I've imbued my golem of product with some sort of essence of soul, and that that can be then regulated. Uh, you know, obviously, when we do international law and other regulations, we like to say we're going to have some lofty principles. We and the Russians will agree on something with the Chinese, and then eventually the techies will get around to implementing it, which, as it turns out, is not how this world works. And they assume that everything that you do in cyber is bound to some physical location, despite the fact that the very word means no physical location, which I find really fun. And a lot of this direction, a lot of these regulations, aside from being built by human rights organizations that have no business writing any kind of regulation, are also built by academics. And so as a hobby, because I need more hobbies other than playing Overwatch, I went through some of the recent research in uh, academic policy and decided to actually read it, which is the first time, as far as I can tell, any of this has ever happened. Uh, so, for example, what, this is one of the recent papers that came out of a United States research organization, and they claimed that vulnerabilities are rediscovered at an amazing rate. It was a little bit like when you first read it, like someone saying that the Earth is getting a lot colder and we should all invest in down jackets, which is true here, apparently. But the, the, the truth when you look at the data is they kind of made it up. And a day after they published their paper, I was like, hey, did you guys notice you made up all your data? And they were like, okay, we'll have to publish a partial retraction. I'm like, okay, let's see it. And the best part about their partial retraction is that they don't want to change any of their conclusions. And that's how you know science is being done. <laughs> so, you know, it sort of woke me up a little bit because the reason these people are even in existence, the reason they get funding from all sorts of organizations is because this is what it used to look like when you went to the top scientists of a new emerging and dangerous field, right? Like, I, you can't really read it, and hopefully you recognize at least one of those scientists. But uh, it's like professor this, professor that, you know, everyone is a professor. And so what happened is government assumed professor meant smart in new areas. But the reality is these people are smart because we sent them off into the desert for a while to build a spectacular new explosion not because they became professors, and that re realistically, this is what it looks like today. Um, we can all play name your best friend. Uh, who's had a shell on any of their machines? Right, so, you know, there's a few people here that you may recognize, but this is not the crew the governments around the world have decided to rely upon for their policy advice. 
or, or even these, right? Like, it shouldn't look like that, is what they're thinking. And uh, this has been a pretty big shock for the system, right? The previous generations have all had a pretty close tie to academia, but especially in the States, that tie has been very severed in cyber. And the, one of the reasons is data, right? So there's a bunch of different ways to get good data in this area, one of which is to be a black hat. And I'm sure no one in this room has ever done that. But, uh, you know, industry also has tended to have, and this is just Microsoft doing their Microsoft thing, but tended to have a lot more data than academia. And that's been a bit of a surprise. And of course, across the, the ferry ride here is Tallinn. And I'm sure I mangled that name too. Originally, I had like all sorts of Finnish references in here, and I couldn't pronounce a single name. And it was going to be really embarrassing. So just forewarned, I'm going to mangle everything. Uh, but NATO produced a big document, the Tallinn document. They've actually produced two of them now, each of which worse than the last. But they're extremely proud of them, so I hope no one in here worked on them. Uh, and th they make one error immediately, and they just double down on it continually, uh, which is a, a thing that's kind of fun to watch. But the reason that they do this is because they are tied to this idea that every hacking event happens in some sovereign territory or another, right? So, you know, when you talk to the Microsoft uh, lobbyists who are very well paid, the, the first thing they ask anytime you go into a room with government people is, how does this work in the cloud, right? Because that's like they've realized that this will gum up the works for days and then they don't have to work so hard. They can go drinking instead of hanging out in these meetings. Um, and it's true because if you look at, say, this is Tallinn too, for them, cyber war is anything where you have to repair a hard drive, right? Like, this is literally what they're writing, and, and what they've, they've, they're holding on to it for dear life. Uh, so I, I recommend you don't read the Talon documents, but when you hear people talk about them, you now know they are nonsense. Um, but don't tell them that to their face, it turns out. Uh, so, you know, and often when I go do these talks to my own team, they're like, what are you even talking about? That makes no sense. That's, that's because my team is really nice. Uh, and they say things like, what do you mean that data locality is not a thing? Because as we all know, data locality is written into most of our laws. Uh, and what we're saying is it's a very hard thing to explain, right? Because, and I like to use analogies to quantum mechanics because I feel like that clears everything up. Um, but... Right, like even in this diagram, they got it wrong because they tried to draw the cloud as a bunch of little points, like it's sort of like, you know, like it's, it's potentially here or potentially here, but the reality is it's, it's everywhere, right? It's a probability that is the thing. That's not a description of where the thing might be. That's the actual thing. The thing is a probability. And I try to explain this, you know, in terms of, you know, when you talk to a lobbyist and you're like, yes, actually data is code and code is data. And they just like, they want to kill you right away. So, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to the FBI recently uh, on panels, luckily, instead of in dark rooms. And, you know, we always get down to hack back. Ha everything in the United States right now in the policy world is about hack back because they know it's another problem they'll never solve, and that way they don't have to actually do anything, right? So, uh, you know, we, we like to talk about what's the, you know, hack back, and they'll all, yeah, well, hack back doesn't really happen for a lot of good reasons. They're like, you know, it's, first of all, it's illegal, right? And we know all the illegal things don't happen. You have a huge chance of getting caught. You know, we, if we caught you hacking into a Chinese machine, we'd have to prosecute you. That's the way it works. Uh, you know, you probably couldn't hire anyone good to do it. And uh, we already provide you, as the FBI, a perfect protective umbrella in cyberspace, right? Except, of course, none of those things are even close to true, right? So, if you're looking at the policy model, you know that it's, it's completely backwards, that it's an empty bag. I, have a, I spent a lot of time finding this picture of an empty bag. And that, in fact, hackback not only is happening all the time, but has to happen, because those are the rules of the policy game. And so what we've become used to is policy paralysis, right? Like, if we're wondering why Eugene Kaspersky is just now realizing his, his you know, company is caught out, it's because he's been used to paralysis. He's used to nothing happening. That's the reality of the strategic equation we all live in. And I think part of that is because we have no arm right now that can understand and analyze the metagame of cyber war. 
So the technical stuff we don't analyze properly, and it feeds into the policy stuff just going in random places and achieving nothing. This is, I, I listened to Harun Mir's talk before I wrote this talk, and my talks are not talks of sun and light and happiness, in case you were curious. Um, okay, so how do we analyze the technical stuff in a better framework than what the policy world is currently using? And many of you know our dear friend, the Grug, whose name is misspelled, I guess, from the beginning. Uh, and what he says is, look, what everyone wants is a ranking. We all love rankings because we like to feel good or bad. I don't know why. Um, but those are useless, and he's right. So I want to talk about how do we recognize and explain actual cyber projection tools, right? Like, how do we predict it? Because the meta shift, the, the shift in the, in the value of any one strategy, which is called typically the meta, is, is not a linear thing, right? A small change in deployment in a particular area, like perhaps hypervisors become very popular, can change a lot of stuff about which parts of your cyber strategy, especially offensively, are useful. So Innuendo is a product that Immunity has built, and it fits a very particular style of implant, uh, which we predicted would be useful because it took five years to even get version 1.0 out. And that, that's something you're gonna see true about a lot of the tools we build, right? Like you're doing ties and research, then it's gonna take you, you know, two years to get caught up on what they're doing and build the right tools so you can start your analysis and then it's gonna take some time to do the analysis. I'm just projecting, we'll find out. So our initial attempt was to start ranking different things that Trojans could do so we could build a metric and look at an organization and say, okay, we caught your Trojan or your implant technology we're gonna look at the technology in it, we're gonna rank it to see where you sit, and then we're gonna be able to track you over time to see how much you're investing in your implant technology and in your entire cyber operations platform, right? So is Germany getting good or not? That's a question I wanna know. The Germans just started listening. So, um, so do you do worms, right? Like a worm can be a fairly advanced complex thing, right? We look at something like Stuxnet or some of the other more advanced worms. Those were big deals. Uh, how do you do your routing, right? So if I'm building an implant, I have many choices in terms of getting information to and from the, my implant. Do I have a spoke and then it, or a, a wheel where it sort of talks to all the other things? Or can I sort of throw my knowledge into a covert network and have it self-routed to the implant that I want to talk to, right? So that's, those are much more complex, obviously, and you don't catch them very often. Uh, and then, of course, Probably the best way to find out if you've been caught is to hack into an antivirus company or your opponent's counterintelligence arm. And we never see that done, so that's, that's fantastic. And of course, the other way to look at things is when I'm doing my operational security, I need to apply segmentation, right? So you don't wanna have one implant caught that then endangers an exploit chain, which then endangers another implant, which then endangers another exploit chain. That's a that's a really common thing to happen though, right? Like that's a mistake everyone makes because we want to constrain our budgets. We don't want to buy five implant chains. We want to buy one implant chain and then use all of our exploits on all of our targets. And uh, especially when you are limited in budget, this is an, an important mistake that everyone makes. Uh, an anonymous deconfliction, you only see people invest in anonymous deconfliction, meaning I have, I have Finland and Estonia on the same box of Al-Qaeda, right? So, uh, I don't want them to know that they're each there, but I also want one of them to say, don't uninstall the Estonian implant because we're okay here, we're friends. How do I do that anonymously, right? Like, this is, these are really hard questions that you've only tried to solve once you've reached a certain scale. Uh, okay, so initially we drew these graphs and predictably we are the best, right? We are the best. Uh, Russia's okay, you're okay, right? Iranian bad. That's... We love having these graphs, everyone loved them. Unfor but we realized that this kind of model only works so far, right? We can only make so many predictive analyses, it only helps us so much. And what we really wanna measure is not the size, the area of someone's skill set, how much they're investing, but the directionality, right? We wanna measure where they're unbalanced. And that brings us back to Overwatch, right? So for those of you who have played any computer game, there's a, there's a particular thing called a tank, right? So here's two examples. Winston, which has those big jump jets on the back, and then Reinhardt, who's a big shieldy metal dude. Um, 
and you have two basic types. And this is also true with, uh, with, with implants, so we're going to get right to it. Uh, just to give you a quick Overwatch briefing, you have your dive tanks. Dive tanks generally are, create a lot of disruption. They are pretty survivable, but not hugely survivable. Their job is to get in and get out, and they have a lot of mobility. And so uh, that's one element of your Overwatch strategy. And then the other side, you could, you could choose instead to use what they call a main tank, which generally is a, a, a territory advancement strategy. So I'm going to slowly creep up and never, ever give up territory. Always just take territory. Uh, and the same thing's true when I build Trojans, and we've seen this for years, which is that people choose one of these two strategies. Right? So you either have, you know, for example, like the, the web shells and the, 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 the word remote access Trojan stuff, all the root kits that are in user space and exist very temporarily and then are very hard to find, right? So they're, they're different. They're weirdly different. That's a strategy in your implant space, right? So the other one is, and we've seen people do this, I'm going to be your hard drive. I'm going to be a kernel Trojan. The investment in building a kernel Trojan is your main tank investment. It's, it's huge, it's one time, I, once I'm on your system, I want to stay there forever without being noticed. That's a completely different strategy, and that changes a lot of how you go about with the rest of your team comps, right? So if I have a dive tank team comp, if I'm using innuendo, then I need to use a particular set of tools on top of that and methodologies and strategies on top of that that allow me to get in and get out without being detected. Uh, so uh, the, the main issue here, of course, is what are my defenders good at defending against, right? Like, this is a question that if you're not, if you're not thinking in the future, like, I have a five-year thing where I'm going to build an implant, and I need to know, are, are the defenders in five years going to be using a strategy that is going to be more or less successful against a dive tank implant strategy? So how do I analyze their defenses and what they like to do? And in Overwatch, as in many, every other game, you have the same basic reflection in your defensive strategies. I can keep the space I have, put a shield in front, that little blue shimmer is their little shield, just to give you some visual analogies. And then uh, put a turret there. I can have characters that just are shields and just sort of keep the space forever. So if you want, um, we can analogize that to, we can play Colonel Core Wars, right? Like if you're CrowdStrike, if you're Kaspersky, if you're Mandiant, if you're Microsoft APT, as they called it confusingly. Uh, you're playing Colonel Core Wars, right? Because the first thing we do is we each get on the box, you're in the Colonel, I get ring zero, and now we battle it out in the Colonel, right? So you're taking space, you're trying never to give up space. You can do threat hunting, right? This is your, this is your, your counter dive strategy, essentially. You're also a dive tank, and you're coming in after me, and you're like, I'm going to find you, right? So you know, Qualys, Tenable, everybody has one of these. OS Query is the open source version of it. You know, any time you're reading, oh, we're going to go threat hunting, you're like, okay, so you're going to let someone take the space, then you're going to come in after them, right? Like, you have to know that's your strategy ahead of time. And of course, the turret defense of cyber is your hypervisor and sandboxes, right? So I'm trying to put a shield and a little turret, and I'm trying to make sure that, that you know, I can detect you, but you can't touch me. That's the idea. Of course, most people forget how vulnerable those things tend to be. Uh, and from the offensive perspective, and I promise to stop hitting that volume button by the end of the talk. From the offensive perspective, uh, we, in immunity, we generally try to build, because we have a limited budget, one wombo combo, right? So a wombo combo is anything in cyber that gets you access and control of the entire internet, right? So when we teach, I swear, We'll someday stop pressing that button. When we teach our PHP class, we actually combine it with our Linux kernel exploit class. Because we know that if you have a PHP vulnerability and a Linux kernel exploit, you control the whole internet. Right? The same thing is true if you're good enough at phishing and have a flash bug, or a series of flash bugs, shall we say. Right? Though these things have natural synergies, and when you're building one of them, you're naturally building the other one. And I think my mic just cut out. But so until you've realized what 
the, the, the wombo combo is of both your offense and your opponent's offense, it's very hard to analyze how you're supposed to build your defense because it's also going to fit into your implant strategy. It's going to fit into your methodologies, who you hire. Um, you know, what's Thomas Lim working on these days? Uh, all good questions. And what you want to do is, because you're building this stuff far into the future, is you want to invest in a wombo combo that you know has some longevity. And generally, you can organize this in a few different ways. At least this is how immunity organizes it. And one of which is just scalability, right? Because we need to, we need to apply our wombo combo to a target we don't know exists right now. And uh, I find that people have a difficult time accepting scalability in cyber offense. For example, a few years ago, someone came out with essentially a mass scan, an entire internet database of every SQL injection that ever existed. And then they were immediately put under covers and everyone decided to forget that was a thing that happened, right? So, you know, if you take, you know, remote method invocation exploits, these days, you know, someone says, hey, here's a new bug in Tomcat. And then some, like the next day, you know, Rob Graham is like, well, here's all of them on the internet, right? Like that's a thing that people do. So, and I find it funny because people want to pretend that scalability does not exist, you know, even when you're making a pen test. I don't know how many of you have tried to scope a pen test, and they're like, well, you can only scan our external net, like, at night because we're afraid of, you know, downtime. And I'm like, yeah, but you're getting scanned all the time. So, I know many of you have had this. All right, so, your supply chain. People, when you build a, a chain of attacks, a natural what we like to call wombo combos, but you can call it something that sounds even cooler. Uh, you need to think about your supply chain, right? Because not only do you have these, but you need to be able to put in each bucket, I need to put a million more. Uh, so the question you're asking yourself are, are these bugs, you know, rare, as people would love to pretend, or are they, you know, common and fungible? And the answer is they're not really either, right? They're sort of more like oil, right? There's going to be pockets of them that are related, and then, you know, vast expanses of wasteland like uh, Arizona. So, uh, you know, the thing that I find, you know, when I talk to other penetration testers, shall we say, is that we all, and I think many of you in this room, have in your heads not just bugs that other people don't know about, but whole bug classes that other people don't know about, right? Like, if you go up to a policy person and you say, you know that buffer overflow thing you've been talking about? Well, we have this whole other thing, this timing attack sphere of excitement that's just as important. But no one's really talking about that, and there's no way to find it with static analysis, and frankly, there's not a lot of people trained up to even look for them. But they basically can get me the same places, right? Like, it sort of blows their mind, right? They're like, no, but we're just finishing solving this buffer overflow problem forever. And you're like, okay, that's great for you. Um, so I find it fun, interesting because this is something that I think we all know, but in the policy world, they have not only don't want to know, but just can't know. Uh, so that's the, the model that we operate under at Immunity. That's how, where we put our money. And I'm not suggesting that that's how you build a model to put your money into it, but perhaps if you did, it would be a good idea. Uh, the obvious offensive meta right now is worms. I think one came out yesterday that I didn't even want to read about because it had a dumb name. But... And that is, in fact, a worm, even though it has the face of a hog. But, I mean, that's the, that's the current offensive meta. And if, you had, if your model did not predict that we are back in the age of worms, then your model screwed up, right? Like, if you weren't already building worm-capable implants, then you were building the wrong thing. And I think that's how you start judging this stuff. Uh, and the, the thing that we most noticed as we started building projections around these models when we combined policy and technical, was that the vast majority of the tools for power projection on the internet were built and maintained completely by non-state actors, which is a blind spot that the policy world had in spades, right? Because everything in policy is a state actor to a state actor since the Treaty of Westphalia. Um, Kaspersky is in the news every day and probably will be for a while. Uh, for some reason, I've been extra mean to them according to them. Uh, but I find it really funny because they're like, we feel bad for you, <laughs> right? Like, I'm like, oh, touche. But it's interesting on both sides, right? Let's say Kaspersky is right and then he's not lying out of his ass, which 
some of us think. If, if he is right, then the United States has decided to use him, the biggest security company in Russia, as, I'm not going to say the scapegoat, but in fact, the penalty for the election hacking. If he's right, we've decided to take the term deterrence, the very thing most nation states live and breathe by when it comes to nuclear arms control, and we've said, we're not going to do anything to Russia. We'll throw a few little random sanctions on a few random idiots. Uh, but in fact, we're going to kill Kaspersky. You were going to take that jewel of a company you have and just kill it for fun, right? That's one option, right? That's the option if you believe Eugene Kaspersky because you're somehow really gullible. The other option is that he had a 10-year plan to build a nation-grade signals intelligence company out of scratch, which is an amazing amount of foresight. And you have to think to yourself, do I have a 10-year plan? Right? Like, what's my 10-year operation that results in something that powerful? And I hope you have one. I know Thomas Lim has one. Everyone else should have one. So what we've realized is that much as the Cambrian age ended, the era of nation states thinking they are the biggest players in the space has ended. We are now in a world full of swimming giant scorpions. And many of you are not up on your prehistoric um, animals, but there's one. He's cute. Uh, and I think one of the things that should have shown you that was LulzSec, right? Like, there was a time when LulzSec ran rampant on the internet, and that really not, no one could stop them. And uh, the, the InfoSuck comic here kind of explains what they are, but what they are was in a way pathetic in, on its face, but still unstoppable. And I think that's an important point. If, one hap if LulzSec happened today, what would you do? Right? If they had slightly better OPSEC and didn't decide to pick on the wrong person and get um, destroyed by uh, a hobbyist, uh, what would we do? Right? Like, I think this is an interesting, like, it's, a, it's a fascinating perspective. And I also find that as, as the Europeans shake down Google this year over data locality of all things, I find it amusing because if you look at the power for a non-nation state to disrupt the covert operations of every nation state, it should give you pause. Because the only reason they haven't done it is they don't feel like it, right? Like, they could very well right now drop every covert operative from, I don't know, Spain into the United States if they felt like it. Which I think, knowing that they can do that should give you a deterrent effect. But it doesn't. Because people haven't figured it out yet. And I think also the targets are going to be non-state actors as well. Right? I find it amazing. There's a lot of places out there that are a little weaker than you think. We can't, as the United States, define the Democratic National Team, uh, which is known for amazing information security awareness, as critical infrastructure. Because they're just some private entity. Right? But in a sense, they are. So I thought, you know, there's easy ways to find out you know, whether or not your private infrastructure is a, is a good target. And as you look at it, as you start looking at where everyone comes from. If I look at everyone in this room and say, where did you come from? You know, we can organize you in a Dungeons and Dragons style chart. This is Doug Song's chart. Um, you know, he's recently announced that his company is a unicorn. He's extremely happy about it. But he comes from a particular place, right? He comes from WooWoo, which he's defined as true neutral, which I think is a little bit um, self-centered. But... Uh, you know, he put immunity down here as neutral evil. We're pretty excited about that. Uh, he thinks that Edward Snowden is kind of good and not just a Russian puppet. So we all have our opinions. Um, but I think it's interesting because, you know, if you look at the charts, very few of them are actually government. And, you know, one of many of our other hobbies, uh, jujitsu is one of them. And I think it's funny because the actual nature of human to human fighting has changed quite a lot in the past 20 years. Ever since UFC came out, we've all realized that fighting doesn't look like Kung Fu. And, you know, we've done that basically through a single family popularizing what is now known as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, and they each had their own little style of it. You know, it, it came from one place and then they sort of each decided to implement their own particular little styles. And those styles were very visible. You could say, oh, you can, he's clearly from the Hori and Gracie family. Uh, and the same thing's kind of true for the, the, the lineages that we all come from, right? No, so when I started talking, you know, to 
the organizers here, they're like, oh, you have uh, Solaris knowledge, you know, because that just happens to be the lineage I come from. But I'm only picking on Tiso because they have pictures online. We all know we all come from other lineages, but these, this is your value system, right? So each and every person in this room has a value system that essentially comes from, you know, their parentage. And it's kind of interesting to analyze because we're still at such a young age in cyber war that you can see the de delineations quite clearly. And what you realize as you start analyzing all the, if you start trying to build a model of this, if you're doing human intelligence, for example, then you realize that the majority of the top tier hackers in the world, in fact, are not from nation states, which is something that would uh, offend most nation states, certainly my own nation state, uh, which did not get to see this talk ahead of time. So does anyone here know about the demo scene? All right, some of you do, right? Here's what I love about the Finns, is that uh, people have forgotten that Future Crew is Finnish, which was the best demo scene team of all time. And what a demo is in this particular uh, parlance was a 3D synchronized music movie of amazing stuff that would run on like an X86, like eight PC AT, for those of you who are as old as the hills. And um, it had to operate in 64K of RAM, right? Like that's how big these things were. They would unpack and then be amazing. And I'm not gonna play one for you because that's cheesy. But uh, you know, what I love is that people forget that existed, right? And that, that there's a level of finished skill that we're gonna pretend didn't exist, and I'm sure none of those people went on to write exploits. I'm sure none of them did, none of them are here. Anyway, so if I am Finland, this is the section, FinAC. This is the section where we say, if we are Finland, what does our strategic analysis say that Finland should do? Because that's probably the most egotistical thing I could talk about on stage here in Finland. Um, but one thing I think would be interesting is to think, how would I catch election hacking ahead of time if I was the United States, right? Like, the fact that you're not catching, and you can't even really tell yourself if it's cyber war or not, is fascinating. But how would you catch it ahead of time? What are your actual strategic targets? Do you have a red team at a national stage, right? Like, can I build a red team on a country level? Um, you know, uh, is Twitter, for example, a strategic target now? I don't know how many, who here actually subscribes to Donald Trump's Twitter feed? And will admit to it, fascinating. Fascinating. All right, so what if someone posted something on that, right? Like, we, we can do amazing things with that. Is what your brain is thinking. I know as a hacker, you're like, oh, I could do that, right? Like, if you had to build a plan and a team to run an op that would break into Twitter and post something as Donald Trump, how many people here have scoped that out? No one wants to raise their hand. I know some of you have. Um, and, and when you scope it out, you look at a few things. You think, what is the cost of failure? If I get caught, who's coming after me? If we're in a world of policy paralysis, nobody, right? No one's coming after you. And, and how, when do I do it for maximum impact? Here's where I'm trying to predict when a strategic event is going to happen to, to me, which will make me sad. And when I look at that, you start thinking, I want to build into my offensive strategic operations I don't even pretend this is a defensive talk anymore. I used to pretend all my talks were really defensive. I don't do that anymore. So, at least not here, because we're not gonna get, get on the video till later. But uh, you can, as a country, buy your way into supply chain attacks. And you can do it for, I think, a very reasonable price of $38 billion, um, which is the current going price of Twitter. Uh, but I think even without that, there's a lot of stuff you can do, right? If you look at what happened to Ukraine with the accounting system that got owned, uh, you know, the targets that are out there that you buy for supply chain persistence are not that expensive. And the ideas that a country like Finland can have when it comes to doing some of these out-of-the-box things, look, I love it actually, because I was originally gonna put all the names in here, but alignments are strategic. Right, that's the, that's the primary thing that countries do. Uh, we're not gonna rub it in your faces that you go different ways. But uh, you know, what I love when you read about Finland's cyber is despite the fact that you've had this conference for 15 years, they're still pretending just to get started, which I think is really good. We do the same thing, right? Like United States until very recently was like, offense in cyber? We would never do such a thing. Fascinating idea, right? But 
Okay, so uh, I don't know how many of you people have watched this video. Uh, there are a lot of places where, that you can align with the way the United States aligns with the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and other exciting places that I think are in a very valuable place, right? So the idea is you don't want to share any strategic conflicts. You want to, in fact, uh, have as few strategic conflicts as possible, which means you want them to be on the other side of the globe and ideally um, in the same basic area of technological development. And Japan's the same way, right? Japanese have the same basic concept of uh, extreme technological advancement, but not necessarily cyber offensively. Uh, so one idea for a, a Five Eyes style alliance. Here's another one. We all forget that India is in fact in the middle of every company on earth. Uh, and so, you know, for example, when you send a vulnerability to Microsoft, does it or does it not go to an Indian team to get it resolved, right? I'd love to get a feed into that. And I'm sure their government does not at all consider that useful. And of course, you can al ally yourself with a private partner, right? So there's nothing to say. You can't go to Google and say, hey, man, we see you're having some problems. Uh, we're happy to alleviate that pressure for you in exchange for, you know, happiness. So I wanted to close with a sort of, well, a Finnish person for specifically, but also when you talk about cyber war in Finland, they don't call it cyber war, really. They call it hybrid warfare, as far as the internet tells me, or when you watch all their talks, which I think is an interesting part of it, right? They're saying hybrid warfare is a permanent part of our security environment, which has nothing at all for us being just a ferry ride from Russia, nothing to do with that. And then when you even go look up the actual term cyber war in Finnish, you end up with Russian propaganda, which I find just an amazing wrap up for the talk. And so I know this talk necessarily doesn't really answer a ton of questions. I tried to present our framework for understanding things, why, where we put our money. That doesn't mean you have to put your money where we put our money. But hopefully it, it allowed you to ask yourself some questions and was in some sense useful and uh, hopefully woke us up now that the projector's working. So that's all I have. So thank you so much.